Verse, the programming language for Unreal Engine for Fortnite and Creative 2.0, is a bit unlike other programming languages. This is an overview of the Verse programming language, targeted at practicing programmers. I'm not going to cover basics like how to compare numbers, but I will cover what Verse offers by comparing it to other languages like JavaScript and Rust. So what is Verse? Verse is a strongly typed, expression-based, immutable by default language. If you write Rust, this is going to sound very familiar, and you're going to feel at least partially at home. If you write JavaScript, this means that Verse is closer to a TypeScript where const is the default. Verse is multi-paradigm, like most languages are these days, honestly, but it does take quite a bit from functional and logic-based languages. Failure in Verse is control flow, in the sense that you can access a vec or array by index, and if that index is out of bounds, do one thing, and if it's in bounds, do another. This is built in at the language level. You do not have to check for existence before trying to access a value that might not exist. Verse also features structured concurrency at the language level, which may not mean a lot to you if you're used to JavaScript or even Rust, but we'll get into it. If you're interested in how languages develop, Verse has a couple things that are interesting about it. For example, Verse is based on a core Verse language, the same way Haskell is based on a core Lambda calculus. This means that you can think of the way a Verse program compiles as a series of rewrites from one syntax into another until you reach the smaller core language by removing and rewriting syntax out. Verse is, at a high level, the effort of pushing a functional logic language out of research and into mainstream usage. In that way, it's a bit novel. You might still recognize some functionality from Haskell or Prolog, but it isn't a purely functional language like Haskell or fully featured Prolog. The spec is open, and the compiler and VM implementations are also intended to be open source licensed in the future. And if you've used such approaches before, you'll recognize a strong language level software transactional memory implementation as we move forward. There's quite a few of the usual expressions like comparison operators and etc. Here are some of the more interesting ones. Ranges are included, so you can do 1.5 and get a range of numbers from 1 to 5. And Verse also includes a concept of option. This ties a little bit into how Verse thinks about failure, and the option type isn't really the same kind of option as a sum or a none in Rust, but it is very similar conceptually. Verse does have a concept of classes and subclasses, as well as a concept of structs with typed fields. Decision expressions like not, and, and or give you control over the success or failure decision flow, while a query expression written with the operator question mark checks whether some logic or option value is true. The comment syntaxes are fairly straightforward. There's the single line comment with a hash, an inline block comment with an angle bracket and then a hash surrounding. Multi-line block comments are exactly the same, but on multiple lines. You can nest comments, which is kind of useful for commenting out large blocks of code. So you don't have to make sure that your comment starts in a specific spot and ends in a specific spot. You can just comment out the entire expression, including any comments inside of it. And if you're a white space sensitive kind of person, there are white space sensitive indented comments. Constants and variables end up working much the way they do in other languages. Const is a constant, something that doesn't change and a var is a variable which can change. Colon equals is used for assignment, which is similar to languages like Go. And if we want to change the value in a variable, we use set and then the operator we want to use to change that value. There are a couple of interesting types. I'm going to kind of gloss over them a little bit because they're not critical to using the language. The two that I'm going to mention are any and void. Void is basically kind of like unit. If your function returns void, it's not really returning anything and there's nothing you can do with that return value. And any is kind of like the super type. We can't do anything really with a value that is an any type because we don't know enough about it to know if it has any functions on it that we can even call. Booleans are a bit of an interesting case in verse where true and false are actually logic literals where logic is a type. And while in practice, this does end up feeling a a lot like just having true and false values. It is a little bit wrapped up in the concept of failure, failure contexts, and how the language works as a whole. You can use the query operator or the question mark for testing if an expression is true, not for negation. Open and close angle bracket is not equal to, so we don't use an exclamation point for that like we would in other languages. And Boolean and and Boolean or, or the and and or operators are the words and and or, not ampersand ampersand or pipe pipe like they might be somewhere else. However, one of the more mind bendy differences from other languages is the idea of failure contexts and transaction blocks. As we discussed in the intro, you can do arbitrary array access in an if expression. If an item exists at the index, then the element 
element variable here is that item and that item will get logged out. If not, then nothing happens and the index access doesn't cause a panic or a crash. Now in a language like JavaScript, this could return undefined or in a language like Rust, this could panic and crash your program. But you can roughly think of this as kind of returning an option type that is immediately checked and unwrapped. This also extends into more complicated scenarios once you start using not, but I think the basics are okay for now. If you want more advanced videos for failure contexts and how to deal with failure in verse in general, uh, let me know in the comments. Code blocks are almost universally used in all programming languages, but there are a couple different ways you can write them in verse. There's the Python style white space approach, which is white space based, just like Python. There's the multi-line braced format. So you've got your if expression or whatnot, and then the code block is contained in curly braces. I kind of prefer this. It feels clear to me. I like the consistency of always denoting where a block starts and ends, but I know that people prefer white space instead. And there's even a single line dot format, which I'm gonna be honest, I don't find myself wanting to use, but it is there. And I do know that people love things like this in JavaScript or other languages. So it's there if you want it. Defining functions is pretty similar to other languages. You've got the name of the function, the arguments and their types. Optional arguments are signified with question mark and default values can be provided for those optional arguments. The body of the function is last, but we can get more involved. Here's an example that is basically the extreme example of the function definition syntax. We've got the function name on the left, a specifier after that, the arguments and their types, followed by the effects that this function contains or runs, the return type of that function, and then the function body. The specifier on the function name is related to things like the visibility of the function in a module or if it's overriding another function for a class, while the effect after is part of the function type signature and can change how you interact with this function. For example, looking at the function that we just defined, it uses the effect decides. Decides means that you have to call that function with square brackets because this function might fail. In all other cases, you call a function using parens, which is pretty common in languages. Function overloading does exist, so you can define a function with the same name multiple times as long as the function's arguments don't match other definitions. Here we've got two function definitions for the function next, one which takes an int and returns an int, and the other which takes a float and returns a float. Calling these functions is as easy as passing in either an int or a float to next. And since this function is overloaded, we will get the implementation that works for that type. So passing in an int, we'll call the int version of the function. Passing in a float, we'll call the float version. Tuple overloading also exists, which is really interesting. Functions that accept multiple arguments are indistinguishable when calling them from functions that accept a tuple. So if we've got X and Y in a function called second, we can either pass those in as the first and second argument, or we can pass them in as a tuple with a first and second value inside of that tuple. These are the same thing. It's also interesting to note that types are kind of like functions, but we won't be getting into that much more as it's not particularly relevant. Speaking of effects, there are two kinds of effects that can be applied to functions. There's exclusive effects and there are additive effects. You can only choose one of the exclusive effects to use on a function at a time. Looking at these in this graphic represents increasing constraints on a function. So from converges, which is something like sine, cosine, or any other math functions, you pass in an input, you expect the same output every single time. If you have one of these functions and you pass in one and you get zero, you will always get zero when you pass in one. And as we move down the list, these restrictions get a little bit more relaxed. We can tell a little bit less about each function. So the varies effect basically means the function isn't pure. Maybe it introduces some randomness or uses a random number generator. It's not guaranteed to produce the same output for some input. If you give it a one as input, it's not guaranteed to produce zero every single time. It could give you back anything. The default effect that's applied to these functions is no rollback. And that can't be user specified, so don't go looking for that in code. You'll never see it. But one of the more important effects to be aware of is transacts, which means that we can roll back things like state mutations or anything that happens inside of the block inside of our function if anything goes wrong. This is something that's important to know about when you're using failure contexts because you can communicate the ability to roll back the effects of your function without exposing the internals to users. Additive effects then are basically pick one, pick all, pick none. It doesn't matter. Use as many as you want. These can be used, of course, together or not at all. 
The two additive effects right now are decides and suspends. Decides implements a fallible function, something that can fail, whereas suspends is what we'll call async functions. In addition to the typical ability to loop in different ways, we also get the case keyword, which is basically Rust's match operator, as well as defer, which is basically Rust's drop trait. Defer will execute some code when leaving a scope or block of code. So it's pretty useful for cleaning up. And when it comes to async functions, verse doesn't so much use yield or await, but rather structured concurrency. The value that represents an async computation is called a task rather than a promise or a future. Unstructured concurrency also exists with the spawn keyword, but it's discouraged in favor of the structured variations. The structured variations then are sync, race, rush, and branch. Sync will run two expressions concurrently, while race will do the same, but it will cancel the loser. So one of the two expressions will return first, we'll consider that the winner, we'll return the winner's result, and we'll stop executing the loser. Rush is very similar to race, but the losers, so to speak, don't get canceled, so they just keep running. You can think of branch as kind of like arbitrary async code. It's basically rush, but there are no winners, so we don't return any value here. We just continue along the code that we want to execute while the async operations go off in their own direction and just run. Bringing it back a little bit, modules exist and they are namespaced similar to URLs. There are already modules for Verse, Unreal Engine, and Fortnite, but you can create your own as well. There's something that looks a little bit like a decorator, of which the one that I think is most interesting is editable. This is called an attribute in Verse, and it indicates something that you can modify from Unreal Engine for Fortnite without actually changing any Verse code. In this case, we've got some item grinders that we could configure inside of Unreal Engine for Fortnite without having to modify this line of code. Type aliases also exist, so you could, in the same way that you could set a constant, you could set a number type to be the same thing as float, and you can use these to shorten type signatures. If you're passing in a large tuple, you might want to give that a type alias with some name so that you can use it in your function signatures and your function signatures don't start getting too big, too complicated to read. Building on this is really interesting. So we've got a filter function here. This filter function takes an argument of X and an argument of F. The X is kind of an array of integers or a list of integers, and the F is a function. So we define a type alias called int predicate that is a function that accepts an int that transacts which means it can roll back and decides which means it's fallible and the return value of this function is void so this is where we start to see what it looks like to deal with failure what we have here in our for loop is kind of like a list comprehension if you're used to looking at those we've got for y which is any of the x's so in this case y will be each one of the x's or a choice of the x's we will run f which is a fallible function because we use decides in the type. So we call it with square brackets. We pass in the Y value that we're given, which is one of the values from X. And if that succeeds, then Y is returned in this list. If it fails, then it's not. This is the mind bendy part, which is a little bit weird to wrap your head around, but I encourage you to spend a little bit more time with this code specifically, trying to understand how Y becomes any of the X's as we loop over, and F controls whether the block that contains Y and returns that value executes. Again, we know that the function that we're passing in is fallible because it uses decides. We know we aren't using the return type. So if this function fails, not if it returns a Boolean, but if it fails, then the Y value that we're working on will get filtered out. And if it succeeds, then the Y value that we're working on will get included in the filter results. Now, we didn't actually run any code today. There's plenty to do if you have Unreal Engine for Fortnite installed. You can go start using this and experimenting with it inside of VS Code, inside of your Fortnite Creative Islands. I'll include a bunch of links for anybody that wants to dive deeper, including all of the resources that I used to comprise this video. There are papers and videos and talks and GDC announcements and all of them have slightly different information, including some Q&A, which is actually really interesting. There are a bunch of APIs for Fortnite, for Unreal Engine, and for Verse, in addition to what we talked about, but those APIs for UEFN are in beta, so they could change. That said, I think Verse is a really interesting language and I'm excited to use it a little bit more. If you've got any verse questions, drop them in the comments and maybe they'll make their way into the next video. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day and I'll see you in the next one.